Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Sam Alkin and welcome to our COVID-19 office hours for the food industry. If this is your first time checking in with us, hello. To those regulars, welcome back. It's November, the penultimate month of 2020. And I know you've all been paying attention, but it bears repeating, we are in a serious stage of the pandemic. Nationally, we're seeing over 100,000 new cases a day, essentially double what we were seeing in the summer peak. Hospitalizations are beginning to surpass that summer peak and COVID-19 deaths are back over a thousand per day. In fact, I just read earlier today that we hit a single day total that was uh, it was the highest that we've seen since May 14th. And so there are a lot of maps out there showing the spread. But the takeaway is that while earlier this year, you know, outbreaks were bouncing back uh, or, you know, regionally, New York, Arizona, California, Today, COVID-19 is everywhere. There's no longer a question of if or when it's gonna to get to your community. COVID-19 is here now and your businesses, your COVID-19 safety plans and communities are gonna challenge in a way we have not experienced before. So you need to go back through your screening programs, identify key personnel, make sure you've got redundancies, ask yourselves again, you know, we, we've developed our, our COVID-19 you know, safety plans, but again, ask yourself, how are you gonna handle a positive how are you going to handle potential exposures? What are you going to do when there's testing backlogs, right? And you don't know whether or not someone is officially a positive or not. What are you going to do about school, school closures, return to work, right? Look at those seams in your plants, lunch rooms, outdoor breaks, parking lots. Are employees following the appropriate social distancing, face coverings, hand washings, and other mitigation practices that you have within your facility? All right, stress to your employees the importance of these mitigation practices not just at work, but outside of work, right? And the point of these office hours, as always, is to provide a space to learn, ask questions, and discuss COVID-19 and its impact on the food industry. And today we're gonna to start with a, with a quick update on the website, and then we're gonna to go to a great set of experts that are gonna give us their observations from the field so far, what's been working, what hasn't, what should we be thinking about in regards to COVID-19 during this season? And then we'll open it up to you, the audience, to ask some questions. Um, and so let me start off by introducing the panel today. We've got Dr. Martin Weedman, the Gellert Family Professor in Food Safety. He brings a background in both veterinary medicine and food science, and he's also the co-director of the New York State Integrated Food Safety Center of Excellence. We've got Dr. Aliosa Trimick, who is an extension associate in our dairy extension program, who's also been critical in updating and maintaining and curating all the information that we have on the Institute for Food Safety's website around COVID-19 resources for the food industry. We've got Dr. Kelly Neal joining us. She's a professor of microbial food safety from the Department of Animal and Food Sciences at the University of Delaware, where her lab explores the issues of food safety and public health that involve transmission of viruses, protozoa, and pathogenic bacteria. We've got Dr. Ruth Petrin, who's a senior corporate scientist of food safety and public health for Ecolabs, who brings technical expertise in the areas of food safety and public health issues by identifying and tracking emerging food safety trends and control strategies. Myself, I'm Dr. Sam Alkin. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Food Science here, and my research focuses on dairy quality and dairy food safety. And then our experts from the field today, we've got uh, John Luker, who is the assistant director of food safety and inspection at the New York State Department of Ag and Markets. We've got Casey McHugh, the director of milk control and dairy services at the New York State Department of Ag and Markets. We've got Dr. Gregory Young, Joining us, he's the Associate Commissioner of the Western Region for the New York State Department of Health. And we've got Dr. Suzanne Tomasi, who is a veterinary epidemiologist with CDC's National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health in the Respiratory Health Division, where she works on health hazard evaluation programs to study and provide recommendations for workplace respiratory hazards, right, which COVID-19 falls well within, too. So um, I know some of you have submitted questions uh, already. Um, as you're thinking of them, as we go through this, remember you can just um, click that little chat box at the bottom of your screen and you can type your question in there and then I'll read it out to the group and we'll address it. If you happen to be on the phone, when we get to the question point, just please press star six to unmute yourself and feel free to ask your questions. Like as I mentioned, to start off, we'll just do a, a quick throw to Al to give us uh, you know, a quick update on what's going on with the Institute for Food Safety website and what new resources you should be aware of. And then we'll, we'll jump into the observations from the field. Thank you, Sam. Uh, yeah, just, I just wanted to point out yeah, that we have a, a COVID-19 webpage with all the resources that, that you need uh, hosted by, our, by Cornell's Institute for Food Safety. Uh, again, so we have 
a section for specifically for food industry, a section for consumers, um, a section on background uh, about the virus, uh, specific uh, laws and regulations um, that are relevant to New York State, uh, and a section on, on infographics and posters. Uh, under food industry resources, um, I would emphasize uh, the food industry frequently asked questions, a collection of all the questions and answers we got so far, uh, and probably any questions that you have, you should find your answers here. If anything is missing, please uh, let us know. Um, another section that I would emphasize is the, the templates and trainings, uh, where you can find all the SOPs and, 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 and checklists uh, that, that you can use in, in your uh, processing facility. Uh, the main one I would say is the, is the decision tree that, that uh, kind of uh, connects all together um, in, a, in a good plan. Um, under um, consumer resources, um, we have specific frequently asked questions for, for consumers. Um, and I would emphasize as we're going into this um, holiday season to, to, uh, to make sure that you're also uh, taking care of the food safety risks at home. So we have a section on, on food safety uh, practices as well. Um, on the background uh, information, there's a, a set of different trackers, COVID-19 trackers, so you can uh, track how, how the pandemic is developing in your uh, specific area. Um, and under infographics and posters, there's a set of different posters and, and infographics that you can use to kind of help you uh, get the message across uh, with, your, with your consumers and your employees. Um, as always, if you have any questions, any comments, anything that we can help you with, uh, make sure you use the contact list on the page uh, and follow the, uh, the information on the virtual office hours when our next office hours will be. Um, and with this, I take it back to you, Sam. Thank you very much. Great, thanks, Sam. Great, great resources. And that that uh, that flowchart. I, I don't know about uh, other people on the call, but we are already going back to that uh, in some cases uh, uh, to revamp uh, what we're doing and dealing with cases that we're seeing. So um, now uh, the point of the rest of the day is kind of um, to go back out and see what's going on in the field. We, you know, uh, ag and markets and the Department of Health and CDC have been. We've all been living this right since April, and there's been a lot of things that we've learned. Um, and then a lot of new things that we're seeing on the ground. So we thought it'd be great to kind of reach out and hear uh, what everyone is actually seeing. So I'm gonna turn it over uh, to John and, and, and Casey to kind of give us a perspective on what they're seeing um, on the New York State Ag and Market side. So thank you both for, for coming and uh, take it away, John. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me, Dr. Elkin? Yes, perfect, John. Can you hear me okay? Okay. All right, uh, thank you very much for inviting us to, to go through our observations and, and some of the concerns we've seen while conducting inspections uh, throughout the pandemic so far. Um, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna break it up a little bit. I'm going to give some uh, information on our retail food store inspections, also our on-farm inspections and, and agritourism events. And then Casey's gonna fill in with uh, uh, some observations of that manufacturing facilities and, and also joint visits with DOH. I wanna first start out though, by giving a, a huge shout out to our entire staff at, at Agriculture Markets, um, specifically food safety inspection, but I'm also gonna take the liberty to include milk control in that. Um, this is something that, that our staff has, has, has certainly gone above and beyond conducting these uh, inspections and investigations um, it's, it's just a, a, a testament to the strong dedication we have to our entire field staff. We, when we go out and do inspections or investigations, whether it's COVID related or not, if it's a routine inspection, then we are doing a COVID follow-up at, at every location. And that's where we get some of these observations from. Um, so, uh, you know, it is something we, 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 as you all know, we continued throughout the pandemic conducting inspections, did not shut down at all. Um, we discontinued operations for just a few days just so we could get some PPE equipment in. But uh, again, shout out to our entire staff, food safety inspectors, produce safety inspectors, and farm products inspectors. So with that, I'll move on. Um, I'm gonna start, as I said, with retail food store observations. Uh, for those of you who may or may not know, retail food store inspections are, 
or make up about 80% of our inspection database. Um, we do inspect all manufacturers as well. But uh, as far as retail food manufacturing, some of our observations, and, and I'm just going to read off some of the observations that we've, we've received from our field staff. Uh, the first one is obviously compliance with the executive order. It, it increased gradually, um, but, but steadily throughout the pandemic. Now, what's going on now, maybe, you know, we may need to revisit that because uh, obviously the, the numbers are going up again. And some of that certainly can be attributed to the, the uh, non-use of, of face, face coverings or improper use of face coverings. So, um, we noticed that in most stores, retail stores, self-serve areas have been discontinued or suspended um, for their own reasoning to, to minimize uh, access. That was not something that was directed by, by the department, but uh, it was a step that the stores took on their own. We noticed that large stores have social distance, social distancing guidance markings, uh, either on the floor or in the aisles for the customer use. Um, on, the, on the small stores though, however, they do not because in many cases, they just don't have the space for that to, to mark out on the floor. But in general, most of them are, are trying to meet the requirements. We did find that 90 to 95% of establishments uh, had face coverings were properly being worn by employees and the general public. So as a rule, it's, it's been fairly high, the number. Um, as I said, we are checking COVID related issues when we do all inspections and we're noting that on our inspection reports. We're not citing deficiencies, but we are noting what we find. And uh, we found so far that about 90% of our inspection reports show that the, the firms are in compliance with the executive orders. So they are wearing, uh, employees are wearing masks provided by the employer and customers are wearing masks as well. Uh, many retail employees are working behind clear plexiglass at this time. And you'll probably have seen that in, in most stores, uh, uh, convenience stores, uh, drug stores, grocery stores, they all have plexiglass set up at the registers for the most part. Um, hand sanitizer does not does, is not an issue at this point. Supply of hand sanitizer uh, for employee and customer use. All stores pretty much have readily available uh, uh, adequate amounts of hand sanitizer from what we've seen. Um, most of the retail stores have proper guidance documents and the signage posted upon entry into the store, which is a good thing. Um, customer complaints have increased throughout the spring and summer. And we did notice kind of a peak in August. They started going down in September um, and October, but uh, with the numbers going up, I think we may we may see a little peak in that as well. That's what we're anticipating. Um, as a rule, store employees and management are overwhelmingly cooperative and knowledgeable about uh, the compliance required, the reason for the visits, and the compliance required. Um, this one is key, obviously, as with any regulations, management and or supervision set the example. So in the facilities where we did find issues, it usually started at the top. And, uh, you know, if, if the manager or the supervisor was not wearing proper face covering or not doing social distancing when they could, it, it filtered down through the, the employees as well. And we also know that uh, some of the local health departments now are, are actually citing firms and individuals out in public um, and also visiting these facilities with the accompaniment of local police departments. So that's something that's uh, uh, relatively new, but uh, there are a few counties that are they're issuing penalties based on the jurisdiction they have in the executive order. So some of the concerns that we did see though in retail, is there any questions about the observations at this point? Or I'll just, just keep going with the concerns. I wanna make this kind of quick, but. Um, so concerns, employees observed uh, working. Okay, employees were observed working without face coverings are generally, the ones that we saw are generally out of view of customers. We still cited that on our inspection report when it was observed. Um, non-compliance uh, with social distancing requirement of, of employees 
again, is observed when, when employees are out of the view of customers, back stock area, break area, break rooms, et cetera. And this has been a common issue all through the pandemic that the facilities are keeping things in check in the main areas, but then when people go on break or whatever, they kind of, they drop the ball. So um, non-compliant stores, typically, employees are not either not wearing face coverings or not wearing them correctly. You'll see that they wear them down just covering their mouth or just covering their chin, which is you know not very effective, obviously. So uh, face coverings, this, is, this was an interesting one. Face coverings that have been removed for eating, et cetera, in non-food prep areas were observed placed on insanitary surfaces posing additional con contamination risks. This is something that we've seen in a number of stores. Uh, the employees are not, they're not treating the face covering as they should. Um, when they take it off to eat their lunch, they throw it on top of a box of whatever, or, and, and there's concerns both way for the employee and for the, whatever their, their face covering is coming in contact with, so. Um, we did notice also that employees wearing face coverings uh, are repeatedly touching their face with with a bare hand or with a gloved hand. And I know that's a factor that came up very early on in the discussion about face coverings. That, uh, you know, you put you put something on your face like that, people tend to, to adjust it, move it around, whatever they have to do. And, and um, that's that turned out to be true. So um, there is there's more uh, customer resistance to face coverings was noted in rural areas of the state. Um, we did find compliance to be higher in urban areas, but uh, where there was a, a people that were just totally against the idea that was tend to be in more rural areas. Uh, big box stores have had issues with uh, uh, customer face covering use. Um, and many of these stores and, and all stores, many of the stores are now offering the face covering at the entrance to the store. They, many stores actually have an employee. They're looking for people that don't, don't have a face covering and rather than telling them they can't come in, they provide them with a face covering. So the unfortunate thing about that is we also notice when people leave the store, they just take it off and discard it. So you go through the parking lots and there's face coverings on the ground all over the place, which is, which is not good either. Uh, in most cases where there's non-compliance, the reason, the reason is usually basically negligence or ignorance of what's required rather than just disregarding the, the executive order. Um, and in some cases, we had customers respond with very destructive, violent behavior, knocking down shelving units, becoming physically violent with other customers. Um, and management, obviously, they don't want to put their employees in any harm's way. Uh, instructing them to confront customers, which I don't blame them for that, but that's, you know, law enforcement is available for to step in in that regard. Um, let's see. Management typically is aware of the positive cases and they are correct, correctly notifying uh, anyone who may have had close contact with them, something we found. Um, they're correctly isolating the positive employee for 14 days generally. And in one zone, the only positive case investigated occurred at a corporate retail chain store. The firm's dedicated staff members at corporate level were, were, were being used to handle the situation. And they had uh, very well working knowledge of, of what they needed to do at that point. So that's, the, that's what we had for retail observations and, and concerns. Um, Casey, do you want to go on to food manufacturing now or you want me to move on to farm? No, no, I'll jump in there. And, and uh, to your, your opening comments, John, definitely uh, our staffs have been amazing to, uh, to, to work with through all this and also industry. Industry has had to pivot and deal with a, a large number of, uh, of changes that they've faced. And, and we just want to say thank you to, to your uh, cooperation and patience. And, and uh, this is, we've all had to pivot in 15,000 directions at different times and in, in, in dealing with, as we learn more information early on, and as we've all uh, play by play here at the office hours and have watched this evolve, um, you know, this is kind of a, a collective of, of all that we've learned and 
And a lot of that has been feedback from industry of what they've experienced. And, and so I think we're all better, uh, you know, for that. Uh, obviously, the New York Forward uh, application of, of the information and resources and getting everyone together. And, and I guess that's kind of where I'm going to jump in. And, and also a shout out to our colleagues over at the health department, New York State Department of Health. There's been a lot of uh, things with them being lead agency that we've had to work through. I know Deputy Commissioner Trodden has, has uh, worked very closely with uh, their representatives to, to get some of this guidance that you as industry have brought to us to, to seek clarification on. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to kind of jump in, and, and I know that um, we put up, and, and it's on the uh, Office uh, Institute for Food Science that we've highlighted on office hours on the website, but uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about the, the joint uh, DOH and Agriculture and Markets uh, updated interim guidance for cleaning and disinfection of food manufacturing facilities or food retail stores for COVID-19. Uh, this document has been our kind of bread and butter that we've worked from when we're conducting those audits in those facilities. Uh, this is this is kind of what's guiding us to do that. And, and that's talking about right out the gate, signage, stop the spread. Uh, we're also talking about the importance of, uh, you know, hand hygiene and things like that. Uh, steps that you can take uh, regarding the you know, the spread uh, with employees. And those are very challenging things when you're, when you're working uh, to, as John highlighted previously with folks, uh, with folks uh, dealing with the um, challenges of getting everyone to wear masks and, and, uh, it, and it's not been easy. Everyone has different personal opinions and, and that's hard. That's it, very hard. And, and, Kudos to all of you out there who have been on the front line dealing with that because it's not been easy and and there's always those situations out there of you know personal or reasonable accommodations for people someone may have a medical condition and then just because you see someone without a mask isn't always just someone ignoring the rules so uh, there's there's a lot in play and sensitivities associated but um, uh, kudos to everyone uh, out there that's that's been on the, on the front line of that. So, uh, again, uh, working through the document just quickly before we go into uh, lessons learned on the manufacturing side. You know, the, the 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 mask wearing, proper wearing of masks. I don't know how many times on office hours or or when we were meeting prior to of, of sharing the latest thing that I've seen. <laughs> out in the world, whether it was a, you know, a, a chin shield or something like that. And, and we, we need to stick with what we know is working. And, and this document keeps it all in play of, and, and following the CDC guidance as well on proper face coverings, proper fitting face coverings, and, and uh, you know, respiratory hygiene. As we know, this is this is an aerosolized virus that needs to get into the lungs. So, um, just this document also touches on routine cleaning, uh, standard infection control practices. Talks about places for you to fo focus. There, uh, we get into uh, identifying routine clean and, and, and disinfection of high risk locations, and then we also give I. Uh, vantage points, I guess, of frequently touched surfaces, things to focus in on. And as we get into our checklist uh, conversation, just where some of that gets gets worked out a little bit further in, in places that have, we've seen through joint visits with DOH and, and other areas that, that things have kind of fallen apart a little bit. So that includes your restrooms, your dining areas, break rooms, locker rooms, and, and then frequently touch surfaces and, and the schedule for which they're being addressed, right? Um, then you jump into just cleaning and disinfection of those areas and, and how to maintain those. We can't take for granted that while we in many processing environments are controlling those areas, you know, uh, foaming, sanitizing, uh, CIPing certain areas, there, there's also some places we have to. to to think about a little bit and focus on 
that may not have been uh, identified as a frequently touched surface prior to, you know, COVID-19 coming at us. So we just highlight their proper ways to disinfect, talking about, you know, chlorine uh, and, and at proper levels and, and uh, how to mix that up, following label instructions for proper disinfection as, as a properly labeled uh, and, and uh, used sanitizer. Then also we get into a little bit of the disposal of, of uh, you know, how to properly handle, you know, whether it's gloves or, or face masks or any of that stuff. And, and uh, because we've all been in those parking lots, right, where that are just littered with used masks and gloves. That's such a sad thing to see. But um, we talk about it on there. And then further, uh, what what's come to light recently for for many of us that kind of escaped the first wave that more parts of the state are experiencing, and that is the the notification, isolation, and, and disinfection if, if by chance that you have positives in your facility, and and that is really kind of where the rest of this comes out for the lessons learned of of the observations and things to focus in on before we jump into your questions and 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 that is you know uh stop the spread right we're focusing on those work areas uh, make sure that we are wearing facial coverings and and uh the issues in hand you've got common areas um so many people had to pivot everybody punches the clock at the start of the shift uh, those, those are areas that were identified early on of, oh, wow, we've got to stagger some of this stuff and and break rooms. And, and just we didn't previously have that six foot gap that we had to kind of maintain. So, uh, you know, lots of changes there. Um, uh, post is the signage, posting of all the signs and all the necessary languages. I definitely want to emphasize that that is that is a lessons learned something we've run into that it, you've got to cover all of your employees in there. They need to be able to have access to that and the proper number of signs in the facility. You know, if you're running a 30,000 square foot facility and you've got one sign up, we can do better than that, right? Um, one of the bigger areas in, in is looking at the checklist that we're going down through off of that guidance document, smoking areas. This is one of the lessons learned areas that, that was a challenge. You know, inside the, the facilities, we saw a lot of great programs and plans in place, but then you just happen to glance out the window in the parking lot, and here's everyone kind of huddled together. Uh, smoking, masks pulled down, et cetera. And, and that's when we all kind of looked at each other and went, oh my, like the, here's, here's a little bit of a breakdown that we need to focus on. And we've incorporated that, um, you know, and, and signage out there to remind people and, and also not having 20 people all at once. Uh, if there's a common break time to go out, you need to stagger those as well to limit exposure and the number of people together. Uh, break rooms, again, the challenges there. The folks want to sit together and, and converse, and our, everyone's social lives have definitely been impacted by this, but um, still got to gotta, gotta manage that. So, uh, and then jumping in further, again, this, this checklist goes down through uh, hand hygiene, you know, proper hand washing, at least 20 seconds and, and and then after we're constantly seeing people touching masks we we know there's a there's a strange level of uh un, you know discomfort i guess or or uh, we're just sensitive to it um you know people are touching their face their cell phone going in restrooms just uh, proper hand washing is critical no matter what uh, respiratory hygiene, again, as I highlighted uh, going down the guidance document, uh, face coverings need to be provided as per the, uh, the, the executive order 202.16. Uh, employers must provide essential workers with face coverings free of charge. <clears throat> and further going down the checklist, we're, we're talking about routine cleaning. Again, uh, how 
how often is that being done? Are, if there's positives in the facility, have they increased their frequency? Areas to focus in on, you know, floors, walls, trash containers, heating and air conditioning vents, horizontal surfaces, frequently used equipment. And, and then also you get into your high risk locations. You, you, there, you know, people are triaging folks in first aid stations or health offices, you know, are those being properly maintained? Are we disinfecting those after use? Cleanliness of restrooms, right? The, these are things that we do year in, year out and focus on. And, and we need to, uh, as we're evaluating those firms, your firms and working with DOH in the event of a positive, these are the things that we're looking at line by line. And, and they're critical. Um, cleaning this and Disinfection, again, uh, kind of, a, I'm not going to go too far into that. Just, the, I think most of the facilities are, are well-versed in that uh, th as far as what we consider as proper sanitizer. And um, the, the big thing, I guess, just to quickly is, is going down through summing up the, the checklist as quickly as I can. Uh, just notification, isolation, and disinfection, right? So you got to notify your health department if you have a, a laboratory confirmed case. Um, you notify your health department. You need to notify us at Ag and Markets at the RRT at agriculture.ny.gov website, or excuse me, email address uh, that, that sends it to all of us that are on those lists. And, and then we break it up between food safety and milk control and, and work with our Health department partners um, are, you know, performing the cleaning and dis disinfection of the frequently touched surfaces. Do you have your written plan in place? And that's what we're all looking at for what do you do if you have a employee that tests positive? And, and further, again, this Institute for uh, food safety and, and uh, office hours has gone over, and, you know, Al takes care of it every time uh, highlighting all of the resources that are on there and there's templates that are there to help you build that out and i will tell you i, I said this before uh, i have many colleagues who are jealous of of this resource that we have in new york and and some of you are probably from other states or other countries that are on these calls and um it, it's amazing what's been what's been put together here and then just uh, one of the areas that we've highlighted as well on kind of lessons learned are uh, can, uh, the training for those people that are doing this work that may be outside of their their norm. Um, you know, are they properly using the the disinfection or the right the, the the right materials to to apply to that surface to properly disinfect it? So there's there's lots of uh, lots of areas. Uh, again, um, I guess just to, to, for the sake of time, I'm going to quickly pivot and jump into those areas that we've seen, and, and I've highlighted them as I've gone through some of this smoking areas, break rooms, picnic tables, right? Uh, those workarounds that you have to have for all of that, staggering those times, um, uh, shift change, uh, et cetera. One of the areas that is of interest that has come up is some facilities have folks all ride together. And, and that's something that, you know, the carpooling aspect of that also has some exposure concerns to that. So something you need to look at in your plan if, if you have that going on, uh, you know, as per the company policy there, if, if you guys are running a bus or a van or something like that, you, you should have that incorporated and, and worked out. Um, I guess just some poor practices we've seen, uh, improper wearing of masks. We've all seen that out in public and in the plants. Uh, one, one bad habit, and it's hard, right, is, is the removal of the mask to pull it down. So when, when speaking to others, uh, we've all had to ask people to repeat when, when we're wearing masks, but removing the masks and staying at less than six, six feet in distance, that, that, that's a problem, you know, that, that needs to be, that needs to have a cultural change if that's going on all over the place. So um, 
Other areas that we've seen is just the challenges of getting PPE in the beginning. Um, and, and, and still every once in a while, things will pop up. We heard that, you know, the smocks, they had single service smocks recently that they were having a hard time sourcing those. And now the, the, the firm just moved to a multi-use laundering service just because they couldn't get those single service lab coats anymore. Uh, challenges with hand sanitizer, no doubt, no doubt about that. And then, you know, this is an area and DOH is, is on here and I know they've dealt with more of the, the actual situation at hand of those folks that may have symptoms um, of, of them coming to work. Uh, we've heard it, you know, on multiple occasions where someone was removed from the floor because they were exhibiting symptoms and then, you know, further discussions highlighted the fact that, well, they were feeling off, but had an obligation to come to work. And that is, that is a very tough under, under this, you know, known virus that we're all fighting with globally uh, to hear that people are still coming to the workplace when, when they're not feeling 100% and end up being COVID-19 positive. Uh, you can have the greatest plan in the world, but if that person gets through your you know, the screening because they, they're not running a, a fever, uh, that, that's tough to find out later on that the person knew that they were feeling off. And, and um, we also have employees who are working at multiple facilities. That, that's a problem, right? You've got to figure that out and try to handle how you can limit that and then uh, language barriers, the back to the signage and the posting of those, making sure that everyone in your facility has the same training and understanding of, of knowledge of, of, about the virus and what's expected. And then everyone's up against the, the, the social gatherings outside of work that often the workplace is the, the common, you know, the, the thread that binds everyone together and they get together outside of work because of, because of that. And, and we've seen some examples of, you know, pig roast of a, a, a large portion of uh, a firm's uh, shift. And that, that was pretty tough to see. So yeah. I think I'm going to stop there. Thank Thanks you. Casey. Yeah. That, that, that's a lot. There's a lot going on out there that you guys have caught. So that perspective is great. And I guess we also wanted to get, uh, Greg, if you're on the on the call, um, if you press star six, you could unmute yourself, just give you a chance to do that. Kind of give us a perspective of what we're seeing from New York State's Department of Health. That'd be great. Well, good afternoon. Sorry, I couldn't get here sooner. <laughs> I was dealing with a no, bit of a right. cluster issue on our end. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, there is, uh, what we're seeing essentially is uh, a huge uptick in cases. And as we've gone through contact tracing and investigations, it's coming uh, um, from the social side. It's not from the workplaces, um, but it is from uh, gatherings, not necessarily all that large either, uh, which is why the governor came out with his, his recent uh, limitation of, of 10 per family member. Um, but uh, we're seeing it from uh, small uh, parties get-togethers, weddings, and churches. Churches have uh, led to the issues down in the Southern Tier counties for the most part. That was the majority of the spread down there, but we're seeing a lot uh, from weddings as well. So we're, we're into the second wave. We knew this was coming. The issues we're gonna be faced with, um, if you look at the 1918 pandemic, we're following the playbook from that pandemic page by page. So if you go back and look at it, you can pretty much see how things are unraveling here at this point. The problem we're having now is um, it's not the cold weather, because as you know, we're still outside. The weather's been pretty mild. It's the fact that uh, we have uh, uh, pandemic fatigue. People are tired of wearing masks, tired of social distancing, et cetera, and they're not anymore. So we're seeing widespread transmission. And what worries us most from our end Back in the early spring when we had the big issue down in the city, we were able to request outside aid. We got aid from a number of different states, but given the fact that now we're seeing it pretty much across the country, 48 out of 50 states are being hit pretty good, uh, we're not gonna have those resources available. So while we have 
better PPE this time around than we did in the spring. While we know um, <clears throat> how better to treat the disease um, than we were able to in the spring, uh, we're still without a vaccination and we're gonna be running into issues with staffing. And that's our biggest concern right now is the uh, acute care side, the hospital side, as these case counts continue to go up um, and they're getting staff furloughed as well due to exposures, both from isolation of Avila and quarantine. We're gonna be seeing more issues uh, trying to just maintain staff necessary to provide the, the healthcare that's gonna be needed. So um, right now they're um, in the, having a devil of a time with it out in the Midwest. Uh, they're running short of staff um, and they're transferring folks not only out of region, but out of state in some cases for intensive care. Mm -hmm. um, we're concerned we're gonna see that here too. So there's a lot, um, a lot going on and the simple fix is something that most people are, are having a difficult time still understanding, but it's, you know, masking, maintaining is at least six feet, six to eight feet separation, um, washing hands and, and common sense. If we had 100% participation in that, we would nip this pandemic in the, in the bud, considering it's person to person spread. It's not, we're not, there are no other vectors involved, but uh, we're never going to see 100% cooperation in that. So this is going to continue to fester. And um, I think most of us feel it's going to go through all, all through the winter and probably into, into the spring of 2021. Right. Well, thanks for that. Perspective. Yeah, it's definitely, uh, we've got to stay vigilant. And, and we know a lot of the practices that we already need to follow, right? I mean, these are face coverings, right? Social distancing and hand washing we've been talking about, right, since, since the spring. So we've just got to get over that fatigue and, and get our second wind. So um, thanks for that. And then uh, the other perspective that we have coming uh, is then from from NIOSH and CDC. Suzanne, what, what, what are the takeaways that you've been seeing? So um, first of all, I kind of want to give some background. Yeah. First of all, I want to thank you for having me today. And um, so. I second everything that has been said prior to me. Um, I feel like at this point, I'm just going to be beating a dead horse <laughs> um, because everybody um, brought up some really good points. And obviously, um, I will say some of the things you guys are seeing in New York State is not that much different than what we're seeing across the country in food processing facilities. Um, one thing I want to start with is kind of a little bit of um, intro on what NIOSH is for those who don't know, because a lot of times um, when we I say I'm from NIOSH, I get, oh, is that NIOSHA or is that OSHA? So we're confused a lot with the with Occupational Safety and Health Association because we were formed under the same act as um, OSHA was formed, but we are in the umbrella of the CDC, which means we uh, focus on research and recommendations. Um, we do not have the capability to enforce any regulations, provide any fines, um, or close down facilities. So, um, but we're here for the public to um, come if they have questions or concerns, both with in or without of COVID, but right now we are definitely focused on COVID like the majority of the CDC is. And um, I will put in the chat some resources or questions facilities have um, that they can reach out to us um, and what sources they have to ask those questions. Um, as far as what we've been doing, so um, NIOSH's role within the CDC's um, COVID response has been to assist state, local, tribal, and territorial health departments. Um, with COVID-19 cases specifically um, within occupational settings um, when transmission was suspected to be an occupation transmission. Um, we have assisted across the U.S. Um, in meat and poultry processing facilities, seafood processing facilities, agricultural sec sections, settings, um, just general food productions and even food pantries, just to name a few of the places that we've worked on. And um, some of the things that we've seen um, in over the last seven months, again, it kind of goes back to what John and Casey were mentioning that they're seeing across the state. Um, it's vital that facilities have a good control plan. And, and like you said, um, I'm really amazed what you showed on your website of the resources that are available to help facilities um, break down and really put together a COVID plan um, to help 
mitigate some of the transmission that can occur within the occupational um, setting. Um, again, we are seeing improper face mask usage. Um, we'll see in the control plan that if face masks are required, but then when we walk around the facility, um, even sometimes when we've met with management of the facility, the face masks are being improperly worn. So it's not just putting them on, it's putting them on and wearing them properly throughout the day, not touching them. When you do take them off, take them off properly. Uh, make sure you're not putting them in an area that contaminates or exposes that mask. Make sure you come to work with a clean one if you're using reusable ones. Uh, make sure one thing, especially within the meat and poultry processing facilities we were seeing um, is, you know, those during the day working on the production line, those masks can get contaminated or get wet, get dirty. When that happens, a new face mask needs to be put on. Um, so the facility needs to have uh, replacements available and there needs to be some sort of supervision on the line to when they see somebody with a dirty or wet face mask to make sure that they send that employee to get a clean one, clean and dry one specifically. Um, another thing that we've seen um, in our um, investigations throughout the seven month, last seven months is, uh, I think John and Casey both mentioned this was language. Uh, make sure, you know, we're having signs for educational material, but make sure those signs are in the proper language um, for the employees that work at that facility. Um, we were at a facility that had 80 different languages spoken among the employees, and they only had signage in four different languages. Now, I'm not saying that they needed all 80 posted, or we weren't saying as NIOSH they needed all 80 posted, but they should at least, have, they should, with 80 different languages, probably should need, it needed more than four um, different languages to post signage. Um, some other things that we saw is literacy levels. Um, some of these facilities we've been at, the signage has been posted at eighth, eighth grade reading levels, but when we come to talk to the union and um, talk with employees, we found out the majority of the employees only had a second grade reading level. So, so we would find at these facilities that it, within their COVID-19 control plans, they would have all the information and they would be saying that they're implementing it but when we would talk to the union or talk to management, um, employees weren't aware of it because there wasn't the, the information wasn't getting to the employees that needed that information at a at a reading level and a literacy level that they could understand. So that's that's probably uh, another key. Well, that not probably that is another key to that um, signage that is posted without the facility or throughout the facility. Make sure it's at a reading level that can be or not level like literacy level, but reading. Um, easily from somewhat of a distance. Um, some facilities, the print was so small that you had to get pretty close to the, to the sign to, to actually read it because there's so much information on it. Um, and so need, those signs need to be bigger and blown up. Um, and again, I think I saw um, Beth put some stuff in the chat. Um, within the CDC's websites, we have a lot of resources for printing out these documents in a way that can, you know, can be posted so that they're legible from a distance in up to 10 different languages the CDC has them translated into. And we, the languages were chosen based on languages that we were commonly see, seeing at facilities that we were going to. Um, and as new languages potentially pop up, we can get potentially get them um, translated into more languages if needed. Um, another thing I th that was brought up is look at attendancy um, policies. Uh, we've been in some places that um, kind of discouraged employees from staying at home when they were sick. So either they didn't have sick leave, like a lot of um, these types of employees we find are, are living paycheck to paycheck. And so they can't afford to miss work. And so they need some sort of paid leave to make sure they can stay stay home and not discourage them to come when they're feeling a little off. Um, the other thing is we were finding that prior to um, COVID-19, some facilities have attendance policy bonuses where if you were within a, like, a period of time, have perfect attendance, you get like a $500, just as an example, a $500 bonus added onto your paycheck. And to some, these employees, that look, that's a very nice bonus. And so they're not, you know, if they're just slightly off, Feeling off, they're still going to come to work for that bonus. So we're encouraging plants and facilities to to remove those types of um, attendance 
perfect attendance bonuses or, or just to assess their, their attendance policy and um, see how they can minimize the chance of somebody feeling like they still had to come to work um, when they were, were feeling off. So we avoided sick employees from coming in and, and spreading it to coworkers. Um, some things that we found or we've seen that were being used within um, reducing crowding within the like locker rooms and break areas was trying to take break rooms or add picnic areas outside. Um, obviously, the weather's getting colder, so that might not be as much of an option. Um, since conferences weren't occurring in person anymore, um, some facilities were using conference rooms as, as break rooms to, ex to decrease the density within break rooms. Um, one facility we saw had assigned an employee to be, their whole responsibility was to uh, make sure the lunch area was cleaned. And they had a card system where one side of the card was like red and the other side was green um, or just another color to say when to, when to let employees know that that table hadn't been disinfected yet and when the table had been disinfected. So an employee sits down at a green card because you know ideally green would mean go, have their lunch when they get up, they flip it over to red. Um, and then that signals the employee that's in charge of keeping that area sanitized. They come in, um, sanitize it, and then flip it back to green. So when the next employee comes in for lunch, they know that that um, area should be um, okay to sit at and eat their lunch. So those are just some of the, some of the things. Um, obviously, we, I have a lot more, but a lot was covered, I think, by John and, and Casey on, on things that they're seeing it in their investigations. So, oh, well, that's great. Yeah. Thank That's you, Suzanne. Awesome. Yeah, that that actually that uh, that flipping of the uh, of the colors there for the lunch tables is something I hadn't heard before. So that's a good a good suggestion for some people to think think about in but their facilities. One thing I would probably bring up is uh, red and green can be bad for colorblind people. So oh, maybe but... not the best color choices, but the 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 goal of it was was a good goal. It was a good goal. Great. Thanks. Well, I know, you know, there was a lot of observations out there. So I thought it was great to, to let everyone go through all of that. So thank you. I don't know if there's any questions from the crowd. I know there was one of the pre-submitted questions that I, I did kind of want to touch on because it's, it's the other, I guess, maybe not elephant, but turkey in the room, right, is that we're coming up on the holidays. And uh, we definitely got in a few questions around, you know, what are some recommended precautions for the upcoming Thanksgiving holiday? So wondering if, if people would, would uh, from the panel chime in, you know, I know Al has been looking into that. Yeah, yeah, sure, Sam, I can, I can talk to that. So I think the key, the key is to still remember, we, we, we are in the middle of this pandemic, but still people should be aware of also the food safety risks when it come to, comes to uh, these gatherings and, and the holiday times. So uh, make sure you maintain that proper hand washing both from COVID-19 perspective and the food safety. Uh, so keep raw food away from you know, cooked food and any ready to eat food. Make sure you cook food appropriately. You know, if it's poultry, at least 165. If it's ground meat, at least 60. Other uh, meats, at least 145. And you should reach that in the center of the food where it's the coldest. Um, keep hot food uh, hot, you know, at least 140 keep cold uh, food cold, um, below 40 if it's refrigerated and below zero if it's frozen. Um, when, it's come, when it comes to COVID-19, uh, CDC has good guidelines on, on, on how to behave and they just uh, actually published one on how to celebrate Thanksgiving and, and stay safe when it comes to COVID-19. So the key is really the basics. So uh, keep that physical distance, so make sure uh, the, the, where, where you get, get together with people, make sure everybody is uh, able to keep that six feet distance. Um, so of course, wear appropriate face coverings. Uh, if, if you have to remove the face coverings, for example, to eat, make sure you're not talking. Uh, so, you know, so you're not generating those respiratory droplets uh, that are considered a risk. Uh, again, wash your hands, avoid touching your face. Uh, and yeah, don't, don't share food, utensils, cups, uh, and, and uh, clean frequently touched surfaces as much as possible. Um, very important to, you know, before people come in, 
to make sure they don't have any symptoms. Um, um, if, if it's possible, you can, you can actually measure the temperature. Um, people before get together, they can actually also quarantine maybe for seven days um, or even test for the virus if, if that's a possibility. Um, so the recommendation the CDC said is, is if it's possible to get together outside instead of indoor. Um, if, if you have to get together indoor, make sure you know, the space is not overcrowded, that you're not uh, staying in, in that space for, for too long. So the, the entire event should not be taking too long. Um, if you're indoor, make sure you, know, you have uh, some sort of ventilation. If nothing else, try and open the windows so you, you introduce uh, enough uh, fresh air from outside. Um, and I think also a key thing is to talk to everybody that's going to get together before they get together so they know what the rules are and how to behave, uh, what are the expectations and so on. Um, so this is just something, uh, a quick overview of, of, of how people should behave during this holiday times. Thanks, Elia. And I, I think the takeaway there, and it, it, it basically echoes also what we're hearing from everybody else in the plants, right? Again, is you need to be thinking about those those basic mitigation strategies, right, that we've been talking about to control COVID-19, right? The social distancing, face coverings, regular hand washing, right? Think about all those things. Think about the spaces that you're meeting in and all that kind of stuff. And remember that it's, you know, I'd recommend, I don't know how other people in the panel feel, but, um, you know, to, to take things pretty conservatively, right? You know, we've had a lot of COVID-19 fatigue and, and now is not the time to let that uh, continue to set in. Um, so be, be proactive, be cautious um, so that we can, we can stop this spike that's going on right now and get things back under control. So I, I know that uh, we had a lot of questions pre-submitted, but there was so much great information coming from the panelists that I, I wanted to let that keep going. So if there are specific questions that, you, that, that are, you're burning for an answer, um, please email us. Um, our emails are up on the website and we'll get those answers to you or direct you to the right FAQ. Um, and then uh, at our next, uh, our next office hours, we'll have more time for the general questions that we, that we go into. Um, and so, you know, I, I'd like to thank the panel. Thank you, John, Casey, Gregory, Suzanne, for taking the time to give us uh, the perspective of, of what each of the organizations has been seeing. Uh, over the past nine months here during this pan pandemic, and what you know, companies should be should be focusing on within their facilities. What are some of the drop balls that that maybe we should now be catching? That was great. Um, thank you, and thank you to the other panelists that uh, that called on Callie, Ruth, Al, Martin. That we haven't had a chance to talk this time, um, but thank you for calling in, and then thank you all for uh, uh, the audience for calling in, listening. I hope this was really informative. This uh, office hour. Uh, has been recorded and so we will be sharing uh, this information later on so look for it on our website um, and then uh, we will be uh, coming out with the dates uh, for the next uh, office hour which I think will be the the second week of December so keep an eye out for that but again stay safe this Thanksgiving holiday that's coming up uh, stay safe at work stay safe in your communities and remember, right, maintain the social distancing of at least six feet, if not more. Make sure you're wearing those cloth face coverings. Um, and then uh, when you're out and around other people, and make sure you're washing your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. And if not using that, that you're using the appropriate sanitizer. And I uh, look forward to, uh, to seeing you nice and full after the holidays. So take care.